Good morning and good afternoon for those attending on the East Coast. Thank you for joining today's webinar titled Low Dynamics Product Line 2017 First Half. Today we have Henry He, a product management who will be giving today's presentation. All lines will be muted during the presentation and we will take questions afterwards and please use the questions panel in your GoToWebinar um, application to ask any questions. And at this moment, I'd like to hand it over to Henry. All right, thanks a lot, Matt. And thanks everyone. Good morning, good afternoon as well. And also, you know, good evening for some of you joining from even further away. So we have a lot of content today. We'll be covering two products within the Low Dynamics product line today. We'll be covering Low Dynamics Enterprise 5.3 release. We'll also be covering the Test Development Environment 5.6 release. And these products are also commonly known as LDXE or TDE uh, in short. So definitely a lot of content as mentioned today. And you know, right before we get into the content, I also like to just you know, briefly mention that on the marketing side within the next two weeks, you will be out on the road as well. So if you, you know your company or you know someone um, from your company that are attending the, some of these events, you know, feel free to you know, let them know and ask them to stop by and say hi. So we'll be at the HP Discover in Las Vegas. We'll also be in another show during the same week in San Antonio. And also there will be, we'll be in San Francisco uh, in two weeks for the Pure Accelerate event. And on June 7th, which is coming up shortly, there's a virtual wisdom version 5.2 webinar as well for some of you who may be using both the virtual wisdom product line as well as the low dynamics product line because you know since the companies have merged these two comp these two pro product lines really uh, work you know work together to give that end-to-end -end insight from production workload status to workload modeling in the lab environment to deal what if uh, to perform what if analysis all right, so we're trying to get go through a lot of content today, and you just want to set an expectation that I will be going through the content relatively fast. This, the webinar is re being recorded, so if you miss something, and, and if for some reason we don't get to your question or we don't have enough time for Q&A at the end of the session today, there's always also that you know that uh, that recording that'll be sent out later on, and also you can always you know contact you know some of you already know my uh, some some of you already know me, and you can send me an email directly if you don't know just you know send an email to our company, and then that eventually will get propagated to me, and you know we can always address any questions that we couldn't address today uh, afterwards. Yeah, either way, I'll make sure that you get your answer uh, either immediately or uh, within days as, as soon as possible. So. Well, some of you today will be, you know, are more focused on TDE, and some of you are more focused on LDXC, and some of you might use both. And in some cases, I've, you know, past I felt that it's also useful to just level set because, you know, was, from time to time we still have, you know, we still come across uh, folks who own, you know, who haven't heard of LDXC or, or haven't heard of TDE, or might have been or heard of both, but a little confused about what each of these products, is, uh, is, you know, is designed for. So on the left hand side, is, we're going to start with the LDXC or Low Dynamics Enterprise. The primary use cases, not the only use cases, but the primary use cases for these are production workload analysis and predefined workload models where they come with sliders and other simple uh, you know, tweaks that you can make to quickly, create, to quickly create a workload model and you can start running the tests with them. And of course, there are other features such as iteration suites, workload suites, and so on. It's a web-based UI and it's designed to be used in a, in a shared environment because you know, really all your teammates have to do is open a web browser, type an IP address, or type in a specific URI to a specific test result. And then you know, everybody within the organization can see the you know can see what you you know can see what you what you want to share. On the right hand side, TDE, the primary use cases there, again, not the only use cases, but the primary use cases there are for custom workload authoring. So you complete, you, there are no, you know, it, for the most part, there are no predefined workload models for you to start with. You create every single action and command that you want to, that you want to send on the wire, and you create a, you create a completely customized workload uh, that way. And also, it's, it's a commonly used for in-depth QA testing of a storage product. So many of the, this is pretty much a default product that our storage, our storage manufacturing customers would use. And it also gives you that full automation control, not, not, not only in terms of test execution, but also test authoring. You can create a test through automation API, through the supported automation APIs from scratch. It is a Windows program and it's designed for a single user. 
And the most important thing to note is that the content can be shared between LDXD and TDE. There are some cases, a lot of times, you know, our customers are completely satisfied with the predefined workload models that we, that, that we, that we ship, as well as the sliders and the controls that we, that we expose. In some corner cases, there are users who want to either modify these predefined workload models or they want to completely create a complete custom workload on their own. In that case, they will they can also create the content in TDE and then share it into LDX and uh, pass to LDX and allow it to run uh, run there. So that's that's the most important point I think to share here is that these two products, even though they are very different, they're designed for different primary use cases. They are their content can be shared. Okay. Now on the next slide here is <clears throat> I just want to go over some common terminologies and in some cases abbreviations that, we, that we'll be using a lot today. This for the most part applies more to the LDXE content as opposed to the TDE content. So at this point, you know, if you really want to make sure that you understand what's being introduced in this, in this release over the next 10 minutes or so, I think it'd be, you know, I'll just suggest that it's important if you have a you know, piece of paper and pen next to you, you know, just write down a couple of these key terminologies because I'll be using these terminologies over and over and over again. And you know if we're not you know if we're not talking you know if we're not on the same page right in terms of the terminology then it you might not be you might be confused about what is being discussed here what is being presented here and more importantly you may not be realizing some of the value that is being introduced in this latest version of the product so let me just uh, start with some of these key ones here and primarily the top three are going to be the key ones and then I'll, i'm going to pick on another uh, terminology from the bottom half of the table so wdi or the workload data imported this is the ingest engine for production workload analysis so usually what you do is that you you export a csv or some other form, uh, logs and then convert them to csv from your storage array and then you import it into low dynamics enterprise the feature within Load Dynamics Enterprise that allows you to import the CSVs and parse and analyze it, that's WDI or Workload Data Importer. What's after the analysis, after the parsing analysis by WDI, you are presented with a results dashboard, a visualization of what your production workload looks like. Those charts, the KPI charts, the line graphs, and so on. Those that 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 presentation. And that engine is called Workload Analysis, or WLA. So that is a resulting analysis that the user sees after WDI imports the CSV and processes it. Now, there are many different CSV, you know, different stores arrays can export data in different formats. So how do we, how do we know how to interpret this incoming CSV? Well, we, for each different, for each uh, storage array CSV output that we support, we will create an analysis policy for that. Analysis policy or AP is the file that we define essentially as an interpreter that tells WDI how to in interpret the imported CSV. Okay. And at the very end, after, uh, after the production workload has been analyzed, the user sees the visualization and understands what they're looking at, understands the workload characteristics from the production environment. They can go on to proceed to create a workload model. So that's the very last step here. Now, in this workload model here, there are different types of workload models that can be created, and they're listed at the second half of this, uh, you know, the next three, rather, the constant workload, temporal workload, and the composite workload. What a constant workload is, this is perhaps the, the, simplest, um, the simplest form, and this is good for benchmarking use cases. This basically takes an average of the entire time span of the production of workload that you have just imported, average it out, figure out the average IOPS, the average the throughput, and then generates when, when the workload model is generated on the wire the load would not vary over time it will be a flat line of iops and throughput so that's good for benchmarking cases the next one is temporal workload temporal workload is it's a workload model that allows you to mimic the load change over time and during the demo in the, in the next few minutes i'll share uh, you know, i'll be going over the temporal workload and there's another a more advanced workload called composite workload. What this is, is actually creates multiple workload characteristics that will run at the same time as a, as a single workload. And the typical use case here is things like Oracle databases or other you know, complex applications where there are different processes and each process triggers a different IO characteristic where if you average them all together, it doesn't make sense. But if you, but if you uh, individually 
simulate each of those processes and each of those processes workload characteristics and run them at the same time, that makes a lot more sense. That's realistic. So that's composite workload. So I want to quickly go over the, these, some of these common terminologies here. So I'll be using WDI a lot or workload data importer. Uh, I'll be using WLA a lot or workload analysis, and I'll be using analysis policy quite a bit as well. During the demo, we'll be talking about a temporal workload and in another case, composite workload. Okay. All right. Let's get right into it. So across the board within the Load Dynamics product line in the first half of this year, and this includes both LDXC as well as TDE, and of course the load generation appliance as well, the, the, the physical hardware that, you know, that, that is be the brains behind, you know, behind the work load generation on the wire. Key thing is that we are announcing the higher speed fabrics load generation appliances, brand new appliances that are 40, 40 gig ethernet, and 32 gig fiber channel load generation appliances. These are brand new based on a, multi, a brand new multi-core architecture that we have just introduced, so we'll be talking about that uh, later on. Exciting things here, of course, is the production to lab solution for NAS. So previously, we already had this production to lab solution for, for block, so primarily for fiber channel and iSCSI, where you can take a production workload from a fiber channel or iSCSI block environment in the stand environment and then import into WDI in, in, w, uh, in LDXC, get a visualization through WLA and then create a workload model out of them and do what of analysis in lab. So that has been there in a the product for, for Fiber Channel and iSCSI. What's new now is the introduction of, the, of NFS v3. So same concept, same methodology, but expanding, building on top of the original fiber channel ice guys support, now extending it to support NFS v3 as well. And of course, in the very last step of this methodology, where you do the what if analysis, right, in order to create a workload model that looks like the real production workload, you also have to have the temporal workload support for NFS v3. That was there already in the previous versions for fiber channel ice guzzy, so we're adding that for NFS v3. Also, we'll be talking about that as well. So these are the two major, major highlights that I want to talk about. Of course, we'll be spending probably a, a majority of the session today to talk about various improvements throughout the product, both in LDXC as well as TDE, both in terms of usability, user experience, as well as protocol expansions capabilities. And on the LDXC side, we also added some system management capabilities that I'll be sharing as well. So quite a lot of content today, but in terms of high level, there are two, you know, couple, two or three things that you that um, that I want you to take away, you know, that I want you to walk away with today is the higher speed fabrics, low generation appliances for 32 gig fiber channel and 40 gig Ethernet, the brand new production to lab solution for NFS v3 production environments, and various usability, user experience, and protocol expansions for both uh, LDXC and TDE. All right, so let's start with LDXE 5.3, and I believe we should be able to cover this in about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll, you know, and then we'll move on to TDE. And there really is a lot of content in both, so I really hope that you can stay throughout the entire session today. End of last year, we released the 5.2 version of LDXE, and the theme there was to provide insight as as soon as possible. So by so in that, we delivered the iteration explorer feature in LDXE 5.2. And we also simplified the fiber channel user experience in 5.2 by creating the fiber channel FC LUN service test bed. In 5.3, as mentioned, it's a product, the key theme here is a production to lab solution for NAS and the user experience improvement across many common product features. And you know, at this point, I'm actually going to switch over to a live demo because I think from time to time, you know, between combination between slides and uh, a live demo, it always makes the session a bit more interesting. So one thing new in 5.3 is that you're going to see a redesigned uh, homepage here. Now, we do believe that this homepage, this new device, this revised homepage design will make it easier for new users to get more familiar with the product. And, you know, to be honest, I do recognize that there is, is there going to be, you know, there, there always is going to be further improvements to be made and we'll continue to move, uh, make those improvements. In 5.3, what we're going to see is this homepage when you log in. And the workflow is actually more streamlined. On the left-hand side, you have the, some of the first-time setup that's required. If you don't have an appliance or you have a new appliance, well, you got to add it. If you don't have a test bed or you have a new test bed to define, well, you got to create it. And what's more exciting, and I'll get to that in a bit, uh, in, in a couple of minutes, is a preconditioning because uh, you know, one of the first things you got to do before you run start a workload test, well, especially for blog, you got to precondition the array, right? So on the left-hand side, the you know, first column is a set of uh, initial setup tasks. 
In the second column is where you, it's usually this first step of production workflow analysis or this end-to-end -end workflow mo modeling methodology is first, before you can work, model a workload, you got to understand what your workload looks like in production, right? So this, this uh, second column here is designed for anything to do with production workflow analysis. Once you complete that, you can move on to workload modeling and to run workload uh, and to run the tests from these workload models that you have created. And then finally, once you have done that, you will begin to view the test results and create test reports to understand, uh, to, to really understand what is the impact as the workload models that you have just created from production go through different iterations or go through different permutations or go through different loads of uh, scale. Under each, underneath each of these columns, under, you see the subsection called resources. So items listed under resources in the same column are things that you can use to help you complete the task above, right? So if you need to create a, if you need to perform some production workflow analysis, well, you may want to create a production source environment first. You may need to add a analysis policy to LDXC to interpret different types of CSVs. Same with creating workload tests. You may want to be start with a pre, you know, shipping of workload models that we have, or you may want to, you know, while you're running workload tests, you may want to add some condition to, uh, conditions and actions um, for the workload tests that you're gonna run. And then lastly, on the test results analysis side, you may want to create a report template to help you group together a set of test results and compare them side by side. So this is gonna be the new workflow that you're gonna see, uh, the new homepage that you're gonna see when you upgrade to LDXC 5.3. Now, the thing I do wanna highlight here is preconditioning. This is a, you know, pretty much a mandatory step in all workload model, in all storage workload testing, especially for block devices and especially for all flash arrays. For file systems, you know, for file and object, you know, the, the use cases may be a little different. So previously in the product, I mean, we, we have always been able to support preconditioning, but the problem is that, you know, it, had, it was hidden inside a fiber channel workload model or iSCSI workload model. So it was very, you know, especially for a new user, it was very difficult to, to you know, figure out how to precondition your workload and the, and the whole use, the workflow is just very confusing. So what we did in this release is that we brought that out front and center to the home page, right underneath the setup, you know, and that goes right along the appliances, the load generation appliances, the test beds that include your storage rates that you want to test, and preconditioning those uh, test beds, right? Because you know, these three just, they just go hand in hand. Once you precondition it, then you can move on to to do the actual workload testing and so on. So, uh, so this is the you know, for anyone who has who has used our product to do preconditioning and and you know, past you have to use pretest. You find if you find find that workflow very confusing. Well, it's front and center on the homepage now. And at the moment, you know, actually earlier you know, before the with the webinar started, uh, Matt was telling me uh, the, you know some you know, telling me who. Uh, who are some of the folks that were on the call already? And I do remember hearing the uh, um, the name of the of a customer who who actually gave us feedback in this area. You know, so I just want to take the moment to you know, recognize and you know thank you for for giving that usability feedback. And I hope that you know you appreciate that we we have uh, taken that feedback very seriously and made the change uh, immediately in this release. All right, so that's a, that's a, what's new homepage. So. Let's move on to production to lab for NFS v3. So I'm going to have a, I'm going to go over two quick slides at, yeah, as an overview, and then again go back to the demo itself, so you can really see the you know, see the feature working uh, in front of you. So for in 5.3, we introduced the NFS v3 workflow analysis. So NFS v3 as you know, is is definitely the most deployed NAS technology, and it is uh, slowly becoming more widely used in large production environments. In particular, when v, you know, VMware announced support for NFS v4 uh, behind the you know behind their behind their 5.0 release or 6.0 release feature, and and also you know NFS v4.1 is become is also going to become more and more popular. So you know overall within the industry, NFS v3 and NFS and NAS in general. Are becoming more and more popular in addition to you know, to SAN, the traditional SAN, and of course, uh, and of course, object storage is also one of the up and coming technologies as well for you know different use cases. So in LDX E5.3, we added this support, the analysis workflow analysis for NFS v3 that complements the existing fiber channel and iSCSI. And after the analysis, after you have imported your CSV and go through the analysis process, you can create a workload model out of that, out of the production workload that you have just imported in the CSV format. 
and we can produce both a constant workload as well as a temporal workload model. Again, you know, these terminologies, I hope uh, you know, they start to make sense to you now. If not, you know, after the after the session, if you need some reminder, you know, just drop us an email, as, as I mentioned earlier. And as I mentioned also, you know, earlier, that we have to build a, an analysis policy for each storage array and more, more you know, specifically, each export format from each storage array. So we do have to build this one by one because unfortunately there's no industry standard that says, you know, every single storage array shall export their data in a certain way, right? So we have to build this one by one. And then in 5.3, we add a support for NetApp OCI, NetApp PerfStat, and Oracle ZFS. And we'll be able to support up to 50,000 unique shares uh, in, th in this uh, imported work production workload data. And of course, in order to create a workload model that realistically simulates the, the what you just observe in your production environment, you have to be able to create a workload model that changes over time. So production workloads vary over time, of course. There's never a single work, you know, production workload that that's a flat line across the board end to end, unless you're doing something like backup or restoration, you know, the things like that. But in most cases, these are the production workloads they vary over time. And the variation, you know, does not is not necessarily only IOPS or throughput. It's also access patterns and different commands and even different data content as well. So what we did is that we added support for temporal workload models for NFS v3, and the user would be able to create these temporal NFS v3 workload models from WLA. Again, that's the visualization of the production workload uh, after being processed by by WDI. And the access patterns and load will automatically, you know, will be automatically generated, uh, will be automatically determined and generated from the WLA. So you don't, as a user, you don't have to manually specify it. And once you have that workload model created, you can optionally specify and vary the file system size. You can create, you know, a thousand folders or a hundred folders if you want. You can create, um, you know, a thousand files per folder if you like. You can change, specify the random data content or constant data content. And of course, you can vary load. So very important to you know, very important feature and you know these two features the workload analysis for NFS v3 and the temporal workload model for NFS v3 these, they really have to go hand in hand uh, in order to and you know to, to give you that temporality to really allow you to replay exactly what you observe. So let's go back to the demo side briefly. So one of the you know one of the key challenges and I think uh, probably a lot of you can relate to this is that how do you actually get production workload data from your storage array or from your performance monitoring data, uh, per performance monitoring uh, appliances that you may have in your lab environment. A lot of times when we talk to these customers, the most typical answers that we get is, well, we don't know how. That's the, really the most common one. And for some of those who actually knows how to get, uh, knows how to get those uh, data, well, it's actually not, you know, the, the data comes back in various forms and sometimes you get a you know, big log of, uh, you know, a big log, you know, bunch of numbers, and we're, you know, thousands of, you know, thousands of columns, you know, rows, where it's just full of data, full of numbers, and it's, you know, it really is almost impossible to, you know, within a, you know, within a short amount of time, it's really impossible to understand exactly what you're looking at, right? Because all you see, and which is, you know, which is uh, the file I'm about to open up right here, is tons of numbers, right? So for for a s small subset of customers who understand how to get the production workload data. Well, you know what, it looks like this, right? So what, we, what we're building here is a capability that allows you to take this type of data dump, essentially, and turn it into a nice visualization like this. And as a user, you really don't have to do anything once you, have, once you import that CSV. It's that simple. And the workflow is actually very simple as well. What you do is that you go to the workload data importer or the WDI uh, feature that we're talking about. Here, you select that CSV that we're talking about, you know, that I should just show you. Of course, now, you know, I don't want to do, you know, do this right now. It's going to, you know, take us another 10 to 15 uh, minutes here to, you know, to really, you know, for, for that visualization to complete. But the idea here is that it's that simple. It's that straightforward. You take a file, you, know, you select it, and then it will upload it. And once you upload it, you create the, you click on a button that says create workload data import, and that will take you to this next screen here. So very quickly, instead of spending hours or days working with different uh, team members to try to make sense out of this CSV data right here, within minutes, 
you get a very intuitive visualization that tells you what your production workload looks like, how to, how to vary over time, and also give you additional information such as throughput, IOPS, your latency, errors, and so on. And depending on, you know, and really depends some, you know, right now you see a couple of uh, blank charts here, but that's because, you know, there are some information that we are capable of analyzing, but that data is not available in the log. So that's another important thing to note is that how much you can analyze, you know, how much visualization you get from LDXE really depends on the granularity and the fidelity of the data that you get from that storage array, right? So even though sometimes from time to time you see some empty charts here, you're not, I mean, you know, it's not a bug or there's nothing wrong here. It's just that, you know, that, that information is not available, okay? So very quickly it allows you to you know, get a good sense of exactly what your production workload looks like from that time span that's captured in the CSV. And you can continue to further break it down into and what we do is that you take these uh, hundreds of different file systems or uh, or shares. And what we do is that we'll collapse, we'll automatically find you know find a clusters of unique share, uh, unique groups of shares that experience similar different IOPS behaviors. So in this case, we see that well, there's a set of uh, you know there's a set of uh, shares here that are you know that on average have these you know that share these similar IO characteristics, and then we have another cluster of shares. That, that also share these uh, similar IO characteristics. So we'll automatically figure that out and then can optionally create a composite workload that have eight individual workloads side by, running side by side. So that goes back to the example I, I was describing verbally earlier about an application to have different processes where each processes can spawn all different you know, IO characteristics. And they could be you know, talking to a different set of shares. So in the case of block, they're talking to a set of different uh, targets or LUNs. Okay. So once you get this uh, visualization, then you can proceed to click on the create workload model button. And now you're at a page where you can start creating a workload model. So what you're looking at here is, is not the visualization anymore. This is actually a view of the workload that you're about to create. So as you can see, you, don't, you no longer have to start from scratch and create, you know, create the, define the workload model on your own. Anything that we can get from, the, from WRA, from the workload analysis will automatically figure out for you, especially the load over time. And the other thing I want to point out is you know, to look at how closely the production workload matches the generated workload. So this is extremely important, and this is the power behind temporal workload models. So in addition to that, you know, optionally, you can also specify the file system, change the file system, um, create different sizes of file systems, and you can create different um, data content because we all know that data content is just as important uh, in addition to access patterns and the amount of load that you generate to your, towards your storage arrays. And then of course, you can create you know, different scales of loads, you know, loads and, and so on. So once you create, have this workload model created very, you know, it, almost with, without the user, you know, the user doesn't really have to do any thinking. For the most part, you can go ahead and click on a start button and essentially run test and get you know, per second analysis and really begin to understand what is the performance of my storage array in the lab environment if I was to generate this production workload against different storage arrays or against different configurations of the storage arrays. And what next what we want to do is that once you have that first phase line, you can take that workload and create very different variations of it. And for example, in this use case, I'm scaling up to 1x, 2x, 3x, 5x, 10x, and, and put that all inside a workload suite. And then you can run the suite automatically and at the end, get a report that allows you to compare, you know, throughput, IOPS, latency across these five different runs. And really, you know, for, in this process, allow you to really crystallize and understand, you know, how does the production workload, yeah, you know, how would it, sorry, how does the storage, storage uh, environment, storage infrastructure, react and handle to this production workload if this production workload was to scale up at different fact across different factors in the near future. So that's the power behind the production workloads, uh, production to lap feature that we developed for NFS v3. And everything I just talked about here applies the same for Fiber Channel and iSCSI as well. All right, we talked about the precondition and workload there, so I'm just going to skip uh, over a little bit. I, and I think I have just uh, two, slide, two or three slides left here for LDXE, and then we'll move on to TDE. And for those of you who are signing off, only to, you know, only interested in TDE, you know, thank you for your patience so far. We'll get to it, you know, very quickly. So in LDXC, we have also added a set of system management tools, again, based on various customer feedbacks that we got over the months. So now first and foremost is the FTP backup restoration feature for resources. So what it is is that if you have a bunch of workload content created and you have a bunch of suites created, you have a different uh, <clears throat> you know, report templates created, 
And what you want to do is that you want to save that item, but you want to essentially, and you want to bring them over to a different LDXC deployment, or you want it to uh, just delete everything you have, but keep the, all the you know, resources, all, all these you know, workflow models that you have created and report templates that you have created. F2B backup restore for resources is the feature to do, that allows you to do that. So the key distinction here I want to make is that this feature works on resources only. It does not backup data. And examples of data would include test results, yeah, you know, past test runs, past iteration suite runs, past uh, workload suite runs. So any results, those are considered data, and they will not be included in this FTB backup re restore. And if you were to do an FTB backup and restore the resources onto an existing LDXC, all data on that existing LDXC will be wiped clean. So this is very important to note that this is for resources only, and upon restoration, you will get a fresh LDXE system and keep all the workload models, keep all the suites, keep all the report templates that you have created. And you know, don't worry about you know, and don't you know, and it's, you know, during the when you're actually using this feature, the UI will prompt you two times, three times, you know, multiple times, just to let you know uh, about you know, know that you're about to delete all the data, and you know, are you really sure? Are you, tri you know, triple checking if you're sure? So you know, there there is some uh, safeguards built in there, so you don't have to worry about uh, using a uh, user accidentally wiping out all the test results. So you know, it, it, there are some safeguards there. Um, but certainly the most important part here is that you know the distinction between resources and data. And the documentation in the user guide will explain that clearly as well. Another thing is the maintenance mode. Uh, maintenance mode, actually, you know, uh, I think we can just do this in in a live demo as well. So you, a lot of times, you know, you want to, you know, as an admin, you want to come here and update the system. Well, in, the, in some cases, you have customer, you know, you have other users on the LDXC that are still running tests, and they may not know that you're about to, you know, you're about to, uh, uh, you know, update the firmware or bring the system down. In other cases, you want to put the system on lockdown, and then while you're doing lockdown, you can go ahead as an admin to go ahead and you know, delete a bunch of old test results and, and do some cleanup before you want to open up LDXE again. So as an admin, you have the ability to come here and then do enable maintenance mode. You can either en enable it immediately, and when you do every single user that's on LDXE will see this um, you know, text up, uh, up at the top here. And you you can also you know, schedule a future maintenance. So for example, on you know, on uh, June 16th, uh, you know, Friday night at 10 p.m., I'm going to start um, you know, start some uh, maintenance mode. So you can do that as well, and then it will be scheduled. Uh, maintenance mode will be scheduled as well. So this is a tool that you can use to you know anytime when you want to upgrade your firmware, and then also if you want to do some system cleanup. So as an admin you can enable disable maintenance mode, and while this maintenance mode is on, as an admin, you have full access to, L to LDXC. So other, the non-admin users would not be able to start any tests. They will, you know, they will not be able to make any changes. They will see that, that, that warning sign up on the top that I just showed you a few seconds ago, and that's, about, and, you know, that's pretty much all they can do. So that's the maintenance mode, and it's you know, pretty nice in the shared environment. And also, another system management function that we added is a mass delete of test results. In the past, you know, you can only delete one result at a time, and of course, that becomes very tedious. So what we added in 5.3 is that, you, as shown in the screenshot here, you can select one or more um, test results here, and, or you can use the overall checkbox at the top that selects everything on the same page, and then click on the delete button, the delete selected button, so anything that's selected will be deleted here. Pretty simple and straightforward feature, but certainly going to be very useful for some of you who want to get rid of uh, stale data. Composite workloads in the past have not been allowed to be added to the workload suite, so that's the you know that 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 is now supported in workload suite, and that's actually very useful now, especially if you're doing production to lab analysis where you're creating composite workload from the per workload analysis, and you want to you know what I you know like I just show you right, you want to create five different variations of that production workload, which is a composite workload model, and then you, you know, scale them across you know, uh, different scales and then run them all at the same time, I mean, not same time, run them uh, automatically one by one. So that is something you can do now in 5.3 with composite workloads. In the past, workload suite only supported you know, the regular constant workloads or temporal workloads. And in order to do that, we also added a new testbed option. So in the past, there are only te two testbed options that you have in the workload suite feature. We now added a third, and that third is to use whatever testbed is defined in each workload. So in the past, when you run a workload suite, you basically we basically have to overwrite any. You know, we basically ignore any testbed settings that were saved into in each of the workloads, and you have to specify a testbed, one or more testbeds to use, you know, as you're running this workload suite. 
So now we added this uh, third option, which is actually going to be the default option to use a test bed that's defined in each workload. And along for each of these three options, you're also on the UI, as you can see in this little light bulb uh, text box here, will more clearly explain what each of these test bed options does. So as a user, you will no longer be confused about what each three of, you know, each of these test bed options are. And there are other enhancements, uh, notable enhancements as well. On the Iteration Street results page, we took a big effort during the really R&D cycle to really improve the usability and visualization. And there's a modernized look and feel of the Iteration Results page. So for those of you who use Iteration Results feature uh, regularly, you're going you're gonna to notice for sure, you're going to notice the improvements. And so I definitely encourage you to, you know, to pay attention to that if that's a feature that you use. Uh, some of the key things that we did is that at a summary level, we pro provide a better color visualization of the overall status of your iteration street, how many have passed, how many have, have been boarded, how many has failed. So at the very high level, you know, you can, at the top of the page, you, you get to understand how many, you know, how, exactly how did the iteration street run go. And then we also made some usability improvements where in some cases the name of the statistic can be very long, making the column display very awkward. So we have also made changes, made improvements to, you know, to make that visualization more user friendly. And we also, you know, when the iteration street is running, we'll also automatically highlight the currently running iterations, iteration uh, run and surface it to the top of the table uh, so that you, all, you can always very quickly go to the currently running iteration. There are many other new functions and uh, improvements that we just can't get to today. We, all, we also add for our block for SCSI that in, includes fiber channel and iSCSI. We added analysis policies for OCI, NetApp OCI. We added port queue depth, uh, the ability to specify the port queue depth value in temporal workloads as well. In the past, it was only in constant workloads and in iteration suites. So now it has also been added to temporal workloads for block, of course, since we're talking about PQD. Chart rendering, that has been a, uh, you know, this is an area that we continue to improve every release. And in this release, on average, we have the overall improvement is 25% for a long, long duration test run. So if you're running a multi-day test, like five-day test, seven-day test, you can expect the, uh, you know, the charts to render much faster. In some cases, you know, the, the histogram charts have improved by as much as 80, 90%. But overall, across the board, it's a 25% improvement for a long duration test. Um, the pretest, one of the things that you know, complaints we got in the past, uh, also from the customer that, that we actually have on this call uh, right now, is that well, you know, you, by default you set it to a fixed duration of seven days, and then the remaining, you know, duration estimated, you know, five days, uh, two days later, and then all of a sudden within hours it just finishes. So, right now we have made that a, that remaining duration estimate a dynamic, dynamic, dynamically calculated, so that when you're actually running a pretest or preconditioning workload, it no longer tells you that you have six days left or five days left. You know, you. you even when it really did just only you know one more hour left, it will automatically calculate and and update the estimated duration. So there are many other in, enhancements and improvements altogether. We made uh, over I think 30 or 50 I think it's 50 different uh, various improvements in the product in 5.3. So definitely take a look at the release notes. And if you're not on 5.3 already for LDXE, definitely please you know, upgrade to that. All right. As I mentioned, um, you know, there's a lot of content, and you know I you know I am I know I am running through this quite fast, unfortunately. So let's get straight into TDE uh, 5.6 release. So in 5.6, we, you know, as I mentioned, the key highlights here are the higher speed fabric appliances, 40 gig Ethernet and low gen appliance, and also a bunch of advanced expansions for protocol support for file, object, and blog, and we'll go to each one of those. The brand new load generation appliance that we have just released, 40 gig and 32, uh, 42, uh, 40 gig Ethernet and 32 gig fiber channel, these are based on a brand new multi-core architecture that are only available for the 40 gig Ethernet and 32 gig fiber channel. Uh, this has been you know, about nine months of engineering work, so it's going to enable us to do a lot more uh, you know, advanced uh, things in the, in, the, in the near future. So right off the bat, we're able to give you 40 gig line rate and 32 gig fiber channel line rate. So the amount of throughput that you can put is almost 10,000 megabytes uh, per second worth of throughput on a single 40 gig Ethernet port and up to over 5 million IOPS on a single 40 gig Ethernet port. On the 32 gig fiber channel side, you know, about 6,400 megabytes per second of throughput per port and a half a million IOPS per port as well. And in terms of port configurations on the, both of these appliances, 
come in either a two port or a four port configuration. We're already working on an eight port configuration of the load 32 gate fiber channel load generation appliance and that'll be you know, available in the near future. Getting straight into the protocols. As I know some of you are only, you know, are really paying, you know, waiting for this stuff right here. So for NFS V3, you know, certainly this is a protocol we supported for a long time, but uh, one of the, you know, one of the constant requests we get is, well, uh, you know, in NFS v3, there's, you know, the file locking mechanism is not built into the protocol, rather, rather it is supplemented by NLM and, and, and NSM. And the lock types that are specified in the specification for NLM and, uh, is really monitored and non-monitored. So the difference here is that monitor requires both the client and the server to work together. They both have to, they both have, to have NSM running on the locally, and that allows the client and server to be aware of each other's uh, you know, current status. So if the, you know, for example, if you do a file lock and then the server crashes uh, moments later, when the, when the server comes back online, if it's a monitored lock, then that lo file lock will be preserved. But if it's a non-monitored lock, then it's up to the client to, you know, to be aware of the service uh, status and, uh, and, and the restart, you know, rest restarting, pro restarting event and to you know, request a file lock again. So for monitor, it requires NF uh, NSM, and then for non-monitored, it does not require NSM. And of course, NFS v4.1 and so on, you know, that, that have a file locking built in. For we added support for the client emulation of NLM version four, which works with NFS version three. Okay, uh, just you know, confusion, you know, a little bit confusing from the from the specifications, but you know that's just a you know, that's just a fact, unfortunately. It is designed to work for uh, for the LDX NFS v3 client. And so we have added nine new NLM commands and along with per command statistics for each of these new NLM commands. And within each command, you can get additional, you, know, you can get granular control such as block, settings, exclusive setting, offset settings, link settings, and more. You know, those are all basically, you know, these are all parameters that are defined in the specification. So if you know what they are, well, this makes a lot of sense to you already. If you don't know what they are, you know, the best is to just refer to that specification and they'll provide a pretty good explanation of each. And we also provide a sample test for NLM so that you don't have to start from scratch. On the NFS side, we also added a pretty exciting feature called branch control. So in, re in, in real life, right, the real NFS clients, they may respond differently based on certain responses that you get from the, from the server. And in some, you know, for some of, you, some of you who are running advanced test scenarios, you need that similar sim simulation capability where you want the LDX NFS client to respond potentially differently depending on specific response. So there's a lot of advanced functionalities you know, here, and you know, if I was to... Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, create variable feature, the lookup feature, and uh, if you know the status code, you know th today is really not the right time for it. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with these already, I think this will you know click a lot. So really, the takeaway for those of you who may not be familiar with some of these uh, parameters and functions is to just take note that hey, this is something that you want to get back to, you want to follow up on, read on, read about later in the TDE user guide. So what we did in the LDX on the <clears throat> On the, on the TDE side, is that we added, we, we're using the status code feature under the output parameter of a particular NFS action. And then we'll allow you to essentially use a variable. And basically what it does is that, you know, when you, when you take a variable from the, you know, from the response from the server, you can then create a set of if else logic and based on the value that's captured in that variable, which is indirectly captured from the server response, you can determine what to do next, right? So one, you know, there could be simple things that if you, you know, based on a certain, you know, response from the server, you can simply, you know, you know, I'll just log a message, you know, let the let the tester know that you know, me as a tester, I know that okay, I got this particular response, I may or may not be expecting it, so I may or pass or fail this test. Right? Or in other cases, you know, if I get this particular response, you know, I'm going to follow up with another lookup or with another open file or with a different get layout option, right? So there are, you know, there, there are many capabilities here. So this branch control is actually previously already supported for S SMV2 and SMV3. So in this latest release of PDE, it now supports NFSV3, NFSV4, and NFSV4.1. So pretty, pretty, uh, pretty powerful functionality here to give you the ability to create more advanced tests. Very exciting thing on the SMB side, credits. So for some of you who have been using this credits functionality in the past, you know, I know your pain. I know we have gone through, right? You have to manually calculate, you know, do some use calculator, use math, you know, on a piece of paper and figure out what is the va credit value to set. And, and that gets even complicated for large payloads or compound requests for SMB. So 
in this latest release, we made the default automatic. So what it is is that you don't you no longer have to calculate this on your own. This will be you know calculated by default. This will be automatically calculated. So all you have to do is run your scenario, and you don't even you don't have to figure out you know, worry about figuring out the credit value again. This will be automatically set, and the you know, and, all, and will handle large payloads as well as compound requests as well. So if you're running SMB tests, and if you've been you know if, if you've been really uh, you know, discouraged by the the way the credit was set in previous releases. I think you'll find this very encouraging. All right, so that's on the file side, and of course there are more you know, minor, uh, minor enhancements that I did not get to list here. You'll find them in the release notes. So I do want to move on, given the you know, limited time we have, I do want to move on and talk about object. So object storage protocol is something that we have been improving consistently and steadily over the last several releases. One of the, you know, in object protocol, which of course is based on HTTP, runs on top of HTTP, one of the most common, or very common rather, I should say, one of the very common response codes that you get is the 500 or 503 in particular. And it's a pretty general error code that is really up to the, the service to determine how to use it and what it actually means. Now, in a lot of cases in real life, it's usually temporary. For example, you know, if a website is overloaded, then you know, it may be able to tell you, you know, to give you a 503 error, or in some cases maybe under maintenance and it give you a 503 error you know, you know, if, there, if the service did not explicitly implement other error codes to, to issue during some of these events. So usually what they do, and you know, a lot of times these are temporary, and some of these real life clients, they may perform a retry whenever they receive a 503. So in LDXC, what we, sorry not LDXC, in, on the LDX side, what we did in this release is that we added a new option to allow you to do to enable retry whenever you get a 503 from the service that you're testing, a, a object storage that you're testing against. And when you def, when you enable these retry, you can also specify some additional control, such as retry after, you know, retry delay or max retries, right? So <clears throat> so you can do things like uh, yeah, you know, I want to wait one to two seconds before between every you know be, between every retry, and or you can say you know I don't even want to retry at all, right? You can just uh, you know disable it, and then you can say I want to retry a maximum of uh, of the five, uh, you know five retries, and then after that I'm just going to give up and consider that the service is dead, right? So multiple things you can do here, and. The other enhancement that we made is the HTTP pipelining enhancement. So we already made enhancements to HTTP pipelining in the previous release, and now we're just adding more to it. So uh, HTTP pipelining is a technique that is used by services to uh, and, and clients as well to execute multiple requests without waiting for a response. So you know this is starting to sound very similar, you know, for the async uh, or async behaviors or number of outstanding request behavior in block and file. Protocols, right? So pretty much the same concept here. And you know, for HTTP, you know, pipelining, you know, one of the essentially the first in first out principle and the head of line blocking potential head of line blocking issue, right? They can still remain in this case. So what we did is that on the LDX side is that we expand the previous edition of HTTP pipelining to create threads. So in uh, so in the previous release, we added the um, we allow users to create a set of a sequence of HTTP or object storage actions or you know commands in th in threads using the thread framework in, that's already in TDE. So this is the same thread framework that you can use with SMB, the same thread framework you can use with Fiber Channel iSCSI, the same thread framework you can use with NFS. So we're adding you know again just adding HTTP to use threads. But in addition to threads, there's another framework called async operations. Again, this you know the file protocols, block protocols in the past have already supported the async framework that, that we have in the product. So now we in this release we added HTTP support to async framework. So overall now across you know across the object HTTP and object protocol you can use both async and threads uh, the the async feature and the thread feature within within TDE just like you have been you may have been using it with other protocols and these two you know they're not alternative I mean they're they're not exclusive you can you get they can work independently from each other or they can work together because they really do different things now actually for even for those of you who are using LDXE right you're using LDXE workload models you may not be using this well guess what what's behind what's happening behind the scenes when we're doing some reach, concurrent reach and write well it's using threads. 
right? So you know, even though that functionality may not be directly exposed to you as an LDXC user behind the scenes, this is very useful. So what that means is that going forward for object storage workloads in LDXC, we can also take advantage of uh, some of these concurrent operations using threads and async. On the fiber channel iSCSI side, uh, MPIO uh, is an area that we made some improvements on this uh, in this release. So of course, MPIO and Lua is pretty much used in all, virtually all production stands today, and you know, uh, has, you know, there's really no question about that. And often it uses the LUN WWID to identify unique LUN devices you know, because you can have multiple paths that are accessing the, you know, eventually they're going to the same physical LUN ID uh, at, you know, behind the storage array. So what we did is that on the LDX side, we have certainly, of course, already supported MPIO Lua since 2014. So this is really nothing new here. But what's new, uh, what was missing rather, is that there wasn't a very clear feedback to the user whether that MPIO configuration was configured correctly or incorrectly. I mean, you can eventually find out, but it, it's, you know, the process to, to figure it out wasn't so intuitive and was not so straightforward. So what we did is that we added the MPIO Lua status, so it's going to be a new stat called MPIO config that will appear alongside your other commands as you're executing tests in TDE, and it will tell you directly whether that MPIO, con MPIO configuration was uh, was done, you know, essentially was done correctly or not. So then, as a user going forward, you, you know, basically you, you no longer have to do a guesswork. You no longer have to dig through some of these logs to really figure out exactly whether you configured it correctly or not. It'll just be right, right there, uh, right in front of you. All right, for the next few slides, and these were the last few slides here, I promise. It's a variety of uh, usability and other enhancements made to TDE. So, um, you know, on the previous slides, a lot, a lot of these changes, yes, they're exposed to TDE, and in some cases they're exposed to LDXE, but for the most part, they are work on the low generation appliance side, their protocol emulation expansions. So what you see here is a set of uh, features that really applies to all protocols because these are just PDE as a software. These are UI improvements. So this first item I want to talk about is a source control environment support, or rather more, more precisely, it's better support for source, source control environment. So a lot, you know, several of our large customers, they have, central, they have a central repository of uh, TDE projects, and that's pretty common, and your know, source control, you know, both the repository and access to services as a source control as well. You know, certainly, so, you know, we have customers that use Git, we have a customer that uses others, you know, other sources as well. So in the past, what happens is that every time a TDE project is opened, we will create a temporary lock file. You know, so this is a file that appears right above the highlighted file here. So this log file is created anytime the file, you know, this TD project is opened, it's temporarily, and this file will be automatically deleted whenever that project is closed. Now, what we did is that, you know, so so that's fine, and then we have a we, we had a customer feedback that says, you know, that's good, that's useful, but you know what? I actually want a different stage. I want an an, an additional stage that tells me when the TD project actually starts running. So not only when it starts when it's open, but also when it's run. Because I have a large lab environment where multiple users can open the same projects and the individual users may be making changes and a user may be checking in the latest changes into source control. So I want to allow those changes to occur as long as no one's running a test. But when it's actually running a test, I want to lock it down. So what we did is that we added a new stage. So we create a new temporary file called dot running file. Whenever a project starts to compile and run and this file is deleted when the test stops. So that allowed that particular customer who made this feature request to, you know, to essentially provide better support for their TDE users in the source control environment. So for those of you who all may be using you know, Git as well for source control, you know, this could be something that you, you can leverage. And the thing is, we designed this to be generic. It's not a specific API to Git. And you know, it's just, as you can see, it's a pretty generic uh, you know, concept here. So anybody can, uh, you know, you can customize your, your source control environment to pay attention to this temporary file and you know, create some logic there to prevent changes. And of course, um, you know, in order to make that, make that improvement more useful, we also added a feature called Reload Project. <coughs> so this allowed the user to always you know, make sure that they're loading the latest version, the latest revision of the test project, TD project, before they start running a test. 
Another common feedback that we get from Chidi is that, you know, uh, I, I may have I may have Chidi running on a Windows terminal servers, but each time I run open Chidi, you know, I want my own individual individual personalized preferences. So what we added is a functionality for the user to essentially save some of these user preferences. And so what it, what you can do is that each you know once you, as an individual user, once you make some user preference settings, you can export it. Save it as a file, and then in the future, when you open TDE in that shared environment, you can you can apply an optional uh, optional um, I guess parameter or <laughs> variable after the you know after the LDXE TDE uh, .exe, right? And load open TDE with your own user preference settings. So for you know in a shared environment, again, this becomes very helpful. And you know, this this is actually quite useful because in most cases people are familiar, you know, they prefer to have their units and statistics in presented in you know megabytes per second or gigabytes per second or kilobytes per second, but there may be some others who may prefer, you know, megabits per second or gigabits per second. Or you, know, you have all users that have different uh, folders, individualized personalized folders where they save their resources and projects. So you may want to preserve those and show those preferences as well. So you're, you're going to be able to get this if you upgrade to the latest version of TDE. For some of you who have been using custom CDB builder in the past, I know that again this has been a painful because you have to create the custom CDB bit by bit, byte by byte from scratch from an empty template. And as you all know, you know there are hundreds of SCSI CDBs defined across SPC, uh, SBC, SSC, and SMC specifications. Right, the SCSI primary, uh, primary commands, block commands, uh, streaming commands, and media commands, and so on. So a lot of SCSI CDBs here. We provide native support for most of the co most common ones, but there are some that you you want to you, you you may but for a lot of those that are corner cases, you still want to use them. We have to use custom CDB for it. So in the past, you have to build these CDBs one by one, but in the new release, you no longer have to do that. We're we're going to provide a set of uh, templates that that you can use and create and start basically open it, pull into CDB builder, custom CDB builder. And then modify from there and save as save as a new custom CDB. And I think the, the two or yeah, just two more uh, two things left, and you know I think we we'll only have a couple of minutes for Q and A. So one thing that this is going to be very useful for a lot of you is uh, the option to have absolute timestamp. For pretty much since the beginning of the TDE product, we have supported relative timestamps. So when you start a test. Well, you know, that first time mark would be zero seconds, and then you know, the next mark would be one second, the next would be two seconds, you know, hours later would be two hours late from the beginning of the test. Well, now you have the ability to optionally use absolute timestamp. So that will allow you to start to correlate the data and the statistics presented by Load Dynamics with the data that you're collecting in your own logs or in third-party environments and really start to correlate and figure out exactly what happened, right? The time source of these absolute timestamps is coming from the load generation appliance time clock, and that load generation appliance time clock can, can, can be obtained through NTP, which was introduced in earlier versions. So now you really have a way to synchronize the timestamps and you know, through, through the use of absolute timestamps, you really correlate what's going on across your entire test environment across different devices, and that's available in both charts as well as exported CSVs. All right, last item here. So for those of you who use the user parameter field, uh, you know, for example, if you if you need you are, you already have an existing user parameter file, let's say you have a hundred rows of content, and they just want to you know apply some new content there, and this new content only have ten rows. Well, in the past, the existing ninety rows will still be will still remain in the user parameter file. You have to go manually delete it. So now we add a new option here that says clear trailing column data. So if you select that checkbox when you apply the new uh, user parameter data. Everything else will be automatically deleted and cleared. So overall, a lot of uh, you know, a lot of protocol expansions and usability improvements in, in the product. Uh, I I think we have what half a minute or a minute left. So let's see if we can get one or two questions in. Matt, can you help us out here? Yeah, thanks, Henry. Hey, so we have a couple of questions. The first question is, let's see here. Do you provide instructions on how to get these workload data out of the storage arrays? Uh, Okay. Yep. So, you know, so this goes back to the analysis policy and the questions of, you know, and your know, question about how to get production workload data, get those CSVs from those, you know, from a different storage environment. So we have a website called Workload Central, WorkloadCentral.com. Once you get into Workload Central, just click on the. Uh, actually, let me go back here. Click on the documentation um, tab here, 
And then on the left-hand side, there's an option that says how to get workload data. Here we provide some of the ones that we have come across already, EMC, HDS, HD, NetApp, IBM. So as, you know, as, we, come, as we come across more, we'll, populate, you know, we'll publish that information here. So the website is workloadcentral.com. Okay, got it. The next question is, uh, what if I want to analyze a CSV from some other storage arrays that you didn't list today? Okay, uh, all right. So I think the best way to answer that question is going back to this first tab here, right, when, when we're terminology. So again, the, en the ingest engine here is W workload data importer. This is specifically designed to be very generic. So basically what we have to do is that each time we come across a new storage array um, output that we have never seen before, it's a one-time effort for us to create a new analysis policy, basically a new interpreter. We will create this new interpreter will include in a product so that going forward in the future you'll be able to analyze that particular storage arrays output so and this is actually an area where we really want your help and we really you know, in a way that i don't want to you know almost sound desperate we're begging for your help right because if you want you know if you come across some storage storage arrays output and you anything you want to deal with that in the going forward in the future you know please pull us in work with us you know please help us out in a way that it's a one-time effort. Once we build an analysis policy based on the output, you know, the data that you have that you that you that you exported from this particular source array, then we'll add into product and going forward, you'll be able to start using it. And really, the more exposure we get, the better. And you know, it is really something that we have to build one by one, unfortunately, because there's no standard, you know, industry standard out there. Uh, but that's really the you know the the answer to that is if you come across one, just let us know. Okay, great. The next question is, how long does it take to analyze production workloads uh, for NFS? So this varies a lot, depends on the size of the CSV. So obviously, if you have a CSV, you know, if you have a work, if you're collecting one day of data and you know, it's a timestamp is, you know, every you know, minute, you know, once, once every minute, and then the, you, know, you have, you know, let's say 12 or 14 different stat columns, and maybe you have you know 10 or 10 or 15 different file shares, uh, shares of file systems, or more specifically file system IDs. It's in a range of 10 to 15 minutes. Now, if you have something that's extreme, if you go into the you know, far extreme where you, you have a workload data from you know, multiple days, and it could be every 30 second data, and it's across 50,000 shares of your file systems, you know, that could be you know, that could be hours. You know, to, to be to be honest with you, All right? So, and I think that, but you know, it really, I think that's very understandable i mean th this is crunching through a lot of data and either way and you know that uh, the hours is really an extreme case right in most cases it's going to be in the or in the range of 10 to 15 minutes and yeah i think the key thing to note is that well you know what start the process go get a coffee come back you know it's going to be done right it's way better than spending two days trying to crunch the csv data on your own right Okay, great. And we have one more question because I know we're we're over. Uh, the question is: Is there a Mac version of TDE being developed? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm at, yeah. I'm actually running Mac myself, and no, I'm actually no. There is no Mac version of TDE. Uh, actually, you know, that's a, I, I would certainly love that, my, you know, personally. So unfortunately, no. That that is we don't have that right now, and that's also not being planned uh, in the near future. So I just want to set that expectation as well. So, you know, I'm just going to continue to run a remote desktop that has TD running in a VM in my lab. Oh, okay. And then uh, final question is we have uh, the report uh, legend used to be cut off while exporting the report to PDF and PNG. Is that, uh, is that fixed? <laughs> yeah, let me, let me think. I, I definitely remember reviewing this item very recently. Uh, I don't... I definitely know that we're, you know, I definitely reviewed it very, very recently. I don't think it's in this, it's definitely not in this 5.3, uh, this release that just came, because this release came out about a month and a half ago, and certainly I know that that problem was, you know, probably even uh, before that. So I, I have to check to see whether that's in the upcoming release or not. Uh, one thing to, you know, one thing actually, you know, one general note I definitely want to make, and, you know, is that in, in earlier versions of LDXE, you know, we've been more focused on the functionality because, you know, it was a brand new product. We're focused on workload models, focused on analysis policies. And, you know, and I'll admit that the user experience, you know, was and usability was an oversight. So starting with the 5.3 release, 
we paid a lot more attention to user experience. And if this item is not in this, you know, it, in this very upcoming release, it'll be addressed soon. Basically, what we did is that we started applying. We we have added a new engineer, whose full time, almost full time job, is focused on two things: usability and user experience problem, uh, you know, product in general, and more specifically, the problems that came through support tickets and custom, you know, specifically custom support tickets. So yeah, we adopted this process and we're going forward. We do expect to be able to address these usability um, issues much more rapidly and frequently. All right, great. Well, we're, I know we're over time and uh, I wanna thank everybody for attending today and thank you, Henry. We'll be sending an email with a link to view the replay um, uh, later this week, probably tomorrow. Um, this concludes the presentation for today. Again, thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Matt, and really thanks, everyone, for joining. Really appreciate you, uh, you know, taking all this time to listen to me talk for so long. Truly appreciate it. Uh, take care. All right. Bye-bye.